Gregory, the floor is yours. You are very welcome. Thank you. And Drina and Richard, thank you for the invitation. And it's, uh, as Drina said, we've known each other for five years now, and it's uh, always been an honor to take part in the EPS meetings and, and with the Young Minds Project. So what I'd like to share today are some of my insights from a, a long career path. And, and as Drina said, I've, I've had the opportunity and the, and the blessing to be able to um, interact at university, academia, small business, large business, uh, government labs and, and not-for-profits and I think I've got some insight that can be helpful. I want uh, questions. If you feel you, you want to ask a question immediately, throw it on the chat or, or speak up if there's not too many out there and uh, we'll address it while we're on the slide or we'll wait till the end. I'm, I'm flexible going either way. So let me get the screen shared here. And there, are you able to see the first slide? I don't see any slides yet. Let me go back to the screen share button. Now, now I see your screen, yes. Very good. And there, do we have PowerPoint going? Yep, exactly, thanks. Perfect, all right, very good, okay. Intro slide first, um, and again, I wanna get beyond just scientific method for your career success. From an outline perspective, uh, give an intro introduction on, on why I think understanding what the landscape for jobs for physicists, fo the folks in the physical sciences looks like is important for trying to have early decision points on how to take your career, what some of those career paths can look like, what they shouldn't look like, uh, lessons I've learned uh, along a 30-year career so far, um, what kind of personal initiative I think that you should take as a early career professional or a student uh, that seems to work and really helps define who you are in the workplace, no matter what that workplace looks like. Um, some strategic skills, I think, especially now as many people are working from home or in lockdown, there are some skill sets you may be able to pick up that you haven't focused on in the past that I found really, um, you know, come to the forefront uh, maybe when you're not expecting it, like using Zoom or some of these other digital formats. So then things along networking lines, how to collaborate, and, and then finally, why adaptability is so important. And I think 2020 is gonna show uh, why that is so critical for us. So the, the first point that I'd, I'd like to really share is if you look at the data that comes out of many of the professional societies, if you're getting a PhD in physics or in many of the hard sciences, only 10% of those earning PhDs will have a future position in academia. And when you're in the university setting, they're training you to go into academia but they're only training 10% of the class to do that. So what, what do the other 90% do? Well, I think that's what the real focus of this career path discussion is about today, is you know, what, what should, should your future look like? What should you be thinking about in terms of building a skill set that will allow you uh, to be able to pivot and, and shift from one part of the career path to another? From a applications and, and, and goals, arena for your career path, um, I think one of the key points to understand is it doesn't matter if you're in academia industry or government labs, or there are skills and commonalities that you find and that I found working in many of these areas. Number one, 99% of the cases, you're not going to be a standalone person doing single and solitary science. That left 200 years ago. Uh, there are still a few people that do that. Uh, but I think what you'll find is you're going to have peers, you're going to have subordinates, you're going to have supervisors. So you have to learn how to, to work and professionally interact with those that are your peers, those that you're reporting to, and those that are reporting to you. So having skills in management and how to manage others are important skills to have. Um, I think the second step is, you know, don't look too far forward when you're building your career path. Um, yes, you'd like to be a tenured professor, or like, yes, you'd like to be a CEO or you know, the head of a, a R&D group for, for industry or government lab, 
as your career progresses. But I think what you really should be looking at as you as you network and as you build your path is where do I want to be in five years? Always have a short-term set of goals and a long-term set of goals. As you build those goals, as you attend meetings now, whether they're virtual or or hopefully back in the future, in the future back to face to face, remember that excitement is contagious. Uh, if you go up and speak to someone and, and they see that you're excited about sharing your research, if you, they see you're excited about inquiring about their research, it'll get you to open doors and then to really be able to network um, more proficiently. I think a lot of us tend to be quiet and more introspective and, and not everyone is uh, socially outgoing. I mean, I know I wasn't when I first started and I think that's something to, to understand, but that there are times where you have to bring that excitement to the forefront and share that with your colleagues, with your managers and with your peers out in the field. Another thing that will get you noticed is commitments. You know, staying on schedule, delivering, working hard on your projects, asking good, solid questions, and, and trying to complete programs, complete papers, get your name out there, get your colleagues' names out there uh, in the public forum, I think is, uh, is something that really has people noticing. And, and it doesn't always have to be in really high level tier one journals. It doesn't have to be, you know, winning awards for patents and other things like that. So and I know a lot of young professionals and students worry about they haven't had a nature paper or a science paper or, you know, some of these really high level journals. Start and just build it, build your portfolio, build your CV um, by getting published. It can be a conference proceedings that's peer reviewed. It can be something else. But that kind of commitment to getting your results out there in the public domain will get you noticed. And then I think one of the things you're going to find is, and, and I found it over, over these last 30 plus years, is that any of these areas, industry, academia, government, and even the not-for-profits, those jobs can be very intellectually stimulating, they can be challenging, and they can be rewarding. And I think those really define what a career should feel like. You, you want to continue to be intellectually stimulated. You wouldn't have gone for a degree in physics or one of the hard sciences if you didn't want to be challenged. I, I firmly believe that. And I think that uh, the rewards are being able to collaborate, being able to publish, being able to present your results. So those are the commonalities that you're going to find across most of these areas. On the, um, on the scientific focus career path, I mean, you can, you can choose, and I'll talk in a minute about, you know, not truly scientific paths where you may want to go into communications or public policy. They're still going to have a science flavor to them, but they may not be um, focused purely on the, on the raw science. Um, I think the main thing to, to always keep at the top is, you know, being creative is a necessity. Whether you're writing an article, whether you're, you're doing something in a public policy forum, whether you're trying to make a presentation to your board of directors or to your academic committee, going out and showing why your work is important, why your work is unique, and where you've had to inflict or in, you know, put into place strong thought processes is really critical for getting noticed. Um, another thing to think about is a lot of the topics that you may be working on can be applied to multiple areas. And most of you, I'm sure, have been working, if you're an experimentalist or a theorist, you're writing code, you're using software, you can take your career into an IT software area rather easily with what you're doing. Uh, you can take some of the work that you're doing and apply it to uh, biosciences. I know, you know, some of the projects that I've seen over the last year that may have been work, you know, using lasers to study um, uh, imaging and, and materials are now being used for trying to look at COVID and RNA and trying to look at sequencing and trying to understand you know, what, what does this virus look like and, and how can it be broken. So there are, you should always have your mind open to what application is out there. And, and one of the things I, I really strongly suggested is teaming and collaborating are so critical. And I mean, even in the position I'm in as a CEO, we, our team sits around and, and we will brainstorm and say, hey, we're working on this, but I saw this. And another paper, I saw this in one of the magazines or the journal articles. Do you think we could apply our technology here? And if so, how do we go about doing that? 
so I think having that open mind and the ability to, to, to pivot and try to take your technology and place it somewhere else is, is really critical to being able to, to be adaptive in, in, on your career path. I understand that you're going to have different decision points as your career progresses as well. Um, if you're a student, if you're a young or early career professional, there are going to be decisions you've got to make about you know, where do I want to locate, what do I want to do regarding a family, what do I want to do regarding relationships, uh, what do I want to do regarding science and, and career. So as you continue down the path, understand that what the, the decisions you're making you know, at age 25 and 30 are, are going to be vastly different than if you're 45 or 50. And, and so look at them as they are and why you're trying to make the decisions and then get good advice as you try to seek out the right decision for you. And that really ties into the fourth point here, which is you really need to have your, your values and your vision uh, defined. You know, where do you see yourself going and what values do you set on what you're doing? And I think if you can have that maturity as you try to set and, and, and map out your career path, it's really going to help you make your decisions a lot easier. You know, I know I've been asked to interview for some jobs and I've gone in and talked to them and, and they're like, well, you know, what we really want is, you know, not so much the science, but we want a strong personality to come in and we need to trim down the size of the organization and somebody that can come in and look at people and decide whether they're to be kept or terminated not anything that really excites me. So, you know, thank you, but no, look for somebody else and move on. Those are the kind of values you need to have set on, is this best for my career path? Is this the vision I have? If it's a no and it's no inside, say no and move on. There are always going to be opportunities out there. Um, and I think, you know, the big, the big area is your career path begins with the choices you make. Um, grad school, are you going to grad school, are you going to get a postdoc, are you going to go out and get an internship, are you going to, you know, what are you going to do as you move along? And I'll make some comments about my career path and inject some off of that point here in the next couple of slides. And, and the other thing to think about too is your personality, your psychological makeup, and the sociology around you also shape your preferences. If you are a person that is, is very introverted, and a person that um, is, is not really one that's to speak, you know, wants to speak up or, or go out and focus in front of a group of people, you're probably not going to want to take your uh, degree and go get a job in technical sales. That's probably not going to be the right matching up of your personality and style to the job. So understand that as you're reading job descriptions or talking to individuals about potential postdoc openings or internships. And then finally, the, the last bullet that I put on here is one that I had in one of my very first talks on career path that, uh, that really startled me when I brought it up. And, and, and it's about competition and, and what is the mindset of a physicist? And, and, and typically, if I'm in an audience, I would say, okay, how many of you were number one in your undergraduate class? And I'm assuming everybody on this call's hand would probably go up. And then how many of you were under one, number one in, in your master's level and PhD? And I think what you find is if you're in the hard sciences, you are perfectionist in most cases from a psychological standpoint, and you are success driven. And the thing to continue to remember as you go down this path is you're not always going to be number one, and that's okay. You know, mental health and understanding your psyche, um, you need to understand that it's. You, you know, there's only going to be one Nobel Prize award given this year, and that's not me, and it's not 99.99% of the other physicists. So that's okay. That's not what I'm out there for. So understanding that as you progress along your career path is really, really important because it doesn't matter what you're, you're doing. If you're, if you're writing proposals, if you are giving presentations, if you're submitting a paper for a presentation, you're going to hear the word no a lot. And, and, and for most of us that are perfectionists and success driven, it stabs right in the heart or right in the gut. And I think we need to embrace it and understand that success doesn't have to be perfection. Success has to mean progressing along a path and achieving really great things. And that could be one publication a year. That could be whatever your goal is, that they need to be realistic. And again, you need to understand that you need to take care all the way along your path of your mental health. And if you're 
perfectionist driven and success driven, your mental health is always going to take darts at it. And you need to be ready for that. And it's okay. It is all right not to be 100% perfect at all times. And work on that. That's, a, that's something that if you need help, work on it because it is a huge challenge. One of the other things that I, I, I share with all the groups I talk to is there are a lot of resources out there, especially with professional societies. This is one that I, I pulled from the EPS website. Uh, it doesn't matter what your, your degree is, bachelor's, bachelor's, PhD, master's, or medical degree, whatever, where you go to work, what path you choose, traditional or, or non-traditional, there are free resources or reduced price resources out there for you. There are job surveys. If you're looking at jobs, if you're in industry or academia, Many of the societies have guides on what are the median salaries for beginning, middle, you know, one to five years, five to 10, 10 to 15 years in your career. Use those to look to see if the offer that you're getting is a fair offer. Look at the data that the associations have. Look at what they share in terms of uh, different directions that the, the science world is changing and where you may be able to fit in if you're looking for a change. So I, I'm just trying to say, go to the websites if you're a member, VPS, OSA, SDIE, any of the, the physics and science related uh, American Physical Society, look at what they've got that's out there that's free, make use of it, use it as a database to, to select from and then use the free readings that's typically available for us uh, as members and even non-members and, and especially for students and early career professionals, those memberships are usually really, really low cost. In some cases, I know with um, some of the societies I'm a member of it, it's as low as $10 a year for students and early career professionals. So look at that as a way to start getting visibility, building up uh, opportunities, and being able to network with individuals. As I mentioned previously, there are different types of career paths. 90% of them are not going to be in the academic area. Uh, these are just some that I pulled from some of those free society websites that I talked about. Um, you can take a science or engineering degree and typically apply to many of these areas. And uh, nowadays, a lot of these areas are very much welcoming scientists to come in and, and play a key role. One of the, the stories that I always share is I had a, a colleague that was number one in my class as a, as a graduate, uh, phenomenal memory, uh, outstanding in the lab, had some great publications coming out, uh, went straight to work for one of the, the leading uh, research-oriented industries out there, and then from there transitioned to a tenure track, a funded tenure track position at uh, at a very high quality university, and did that for about five or six years. Decided that that was not the way he wanted his career going. He did he wasn't wanting to go out and uh, solicit funding, you know, for ten different proposals a year in hopes of getting one, and he went back and got an MBA. At a, at a very good uh, business school and became a business analyst. And my guess is probably doubled or tripled the salary he was getting out of academia. It was all based upon science. He was doing mathematical modeling. He was looking at mainly science and technical companies. So there are opportunities out there. And when the pivot comes, you're very well equipped with a science and engineering degree because you've got the mathematics skills, the analytical skills, typically some experimental, some theoretical skills to really fit anywhere in medicine, entrepreneurship, startups, government labs, just various non-academic careers. And, and, and one of the things I try to stress to students as I'm talking is that um, don't let a non-academic career path be demeaning. I, I know that there's always this, this strong impetus on becoming an academician, um, but that is not always the reason for a master's or a PhD. It's, it's to increase your knowledge of the subject and to be able to go and apply it to, to many of these areas here. One of the individuals that worked for me at Naval Research Lab in, in Washington, D.C. when I came out of graduate school had a master's degree and after six or eight years there doing laser work, um, he went and got a, a uh, law degree at uh, Georgetown and finished number one in his class and became the number one lawyer for one of the leading um, materials manufacturing uh, corporations in the United States. And they, they grabbed him immediately because he had that technical background coupled with 
uh, an additional three-year law degree. So there are opportunities out there if you're, if you choose not to go down the academic roadmap. Okay, so two career paths. I will I will highlight mine here from the bottom up and just kind of explain where I've been, what I've done. I started out at Oklahoma State University. I uh, got my bachelor's, I've got two bachelor's degrees from there, one in mathematics, one in physics, and then master's and PhD in physics. Uh, between my master's and my PhD, I took an internship with IBM and was uh, asked about, or I, I applied for a, an internship and, and was given one at IBM. And I, I went there and I think that was really what turned me towards potentially not going for an academic career path. And then the reason being was um, I walked in, they said, hey, we're trying to study this problem. We're etching wafers in this plasma chamber. You're a spectroscopist. How do you, you know, here's your, here's your task. Take and figure out a way so that we don't have to get into the vacuum chamber and you can monitor as we etch through the various lay, lay, layers of uh, material that have been put down on these wafers and help us determine when it's time to change the various gases to finish the etch process. Here's your lab, here's your money, here's your equipment. Uh, go figure it out on your internship. And that I thought was a tremendous amount of responsibility to be given somebody without a PhD. And at the end of the internship, I had the program written up, I had the type of equipment they needed, I had the demonstration, I had it documented and and, and they, they received it well. They gave me um, the attention and the tools that I needed and, and um, let me go and work on my own and use the skill set I had. And that was where it kind of branched as I was going through my PhD and said, you know, I really want to focus on a potentially non-academic career path. And when I uh, was awarded my PhD, I, I left and went to Naval Research Lab in Washington, D.C. I opted not to go for a postdoc. I went there to work on developing uh, new solid state lasers uh, that the government wanted. At the same time, there was an academic opening that a colleague of mine from the university was was chairing a physics department at the uh, University of Maryland in Baltimore County and they had had a professor that had gotten uh, injured and was not going to be able to teach for the semester and they asked if I would teach the optics for uh, uh, medical and uh, nursing students and I took that on for a semester and it ended up going for four years. It was great. I loved teaching and sharing with the students. I didn't have to write uh, for any grants or anything. It was strictly a teaching position but it, it was um, it gave me a flavor for something and I made the decision that wasn't something I wanted to do for my career. So at, at that point, I, I left uh, after five years with the Navy. I went to uh, help start a small company in Florida called Lightning Optical that later became VLOC. And we were manufacturing optics, manufacturing coatings, manufacturing and growing our own laser materials and then selling those into the industrial space. Our company after five years was acquired by 2.6 Incorporated. I was retained and made uh, VP of Research and Development for 2.6. I was there total between the two companies for 18 years. And they allowed me to write proposals. Um, they allowed me to uh, work on patents. They allowed me to continue to publish. Today I have over 130 published papers. A lot of that because the company that I worked for encouraged it. They saw it as a public relations positive for the company. If something came out of a research industry and it went into a publication, they got fee free PR because their name was in every one of those publications. The other thing that I was allowed to do and it was a pivoting point in the career was after we outgrew being a small business, um, our capability to win certain grants uh, dried up because they were typically you know, only for companies that were under 500 people. Uh, so they, the board at 2.6 entrusted me to develop a internal research and development plan that involves talking to government agencies and trying to help establish public policy for better funding for the materials research arena. And so I was able to go to Washington, D.C. on a regular basis and talk to people writing legislation up on Capitol Hill, talk to the various committees to educate them on why certain materials were important. At the time, we were doing laser materials, we were doing things like thin film diamond for coatings to to pull heat away from certain items. Um, I was able to talk to the folks at NASA, uh, at their research centers, at uh, the federal government research labs for DOD and at the Pentagon. So I was able to do that. And then as well, I was taught by the CEO and others how to go about doing mergers and acquisitions, how to look at the business side of it 
So as 26 was growing and acquiring companies, I was able to be included and go and do portions of the M&A to determine is this a good buy for the company or not, you know, given the patent portfolio of the company we were looking at, given the technology roadmap, how did that overlay with what the company was looking at? Those were the kind of things that they entrusted to me to do, and it really wasn't in my PhD physics uh, niche of items that I'd studied. So it was really a great uh, grooming of the career for 18 years along that path. I left to go become CEO of BE Myers in Seattle, uh, developing lasers and optics for uh, Homeland Security and government applications. I left there after three years, uh, helped found, uh, I did my own consulting company and then helped found a company called FlexLight and where we were using infrared laser diodes to uh, stimulate micro vessels to look for healing and uh, do uh, subsurface uh, illumination technologies in the bios space and we sold that company then as Doreen said I went to in 2016 15 16 I went to the optical society and became chief scientist for OSA and that was uh, absolutely an awesome experience to be able to continue to do public policy to look at science and technology from a meeting participant standpoint from the society standpoint to be able to go to meetings at the European Union, at Horizon 2020, at various uh, high-level thinking groups around the world in Asia, Europe, and Africa, and North and South America, and have discussions with some of these world leaders on what did their roadmaps look like and what could we as a professional society do to help enhance that. And then in 2019, I left OSA to come and become the CEO at Applied Energetics where we're making ultra-short pulse lasers. So, as you can see here, I've, I've had an opportunity to touch on a lot of different areas uh, with the career path, and um, it, it's really helped give me a good perspective on what works, what doesn't work, what each of these different uh, parts of the of the industry look like in terms of what you know what are they looking for in terms of hiring, and, and what really works well there, and what doesn't. Uh, some of the lessons learned that that can be applied uh, on this career path, you know. Always try something and see if you like it or not. Uh, what I've encouraged my kids to do, that's what I encourage um, students that I'm mentoring to do, try something. I mean, when I started out, I was studying nuclear physics. And part, when, in my junior year of my undergraduate, um, the professor that was running a laser lab asked if I wanted to come and mix chemical dyes and clean optics and things like that in an optics lab to, to make money while I was going to school. I tried that, I went in and there were red, green, and blue lasers bouncing everywhere, and they were hitting crystals, and the crystals were fluorescing, and there were vacuum pumps, and it was just a very, very different uh, way of looking at things, but it was very visual, and I'm a very visual learner, and to be able to look at that and say, okay, I understand what's going there, much more so than I did on the nuclear side, had me pivot immediately to really start studying solid state physics and optics more closely, and then obviously going down that path for my master's and PhD. Um, I always say if there's internships, fellowships, and scholarships out there, apply for them. Especially having been at OSA and in other places, I'm constantly being written and called and said, hey, we don't have enough applicants for this scholarship. Do you know somebody we should contact? Um, just like when I, when I got the uh, fellowship to go to IBM. I, I didn't think uh, a kid coming out of the Midwest in the United States would have a chance of going to New York and working at their research center, and I was selected. So always apply. If nothing else, you'll learn something. Um, you know, other opportunities that may build upon your your first applications. Uh, you're always going to learn something new, no matter what you're doing. But one of the things you have to always do is ask why. Continue to ask why, even after 30 years in my career. I continue to ask why. Why this? Why that? Why is this growing? You know, what what's happening here? What's the real impetus here? Um, and, and some of these things. You're going to ask why for a very long time. If you talk to the people that have been doing gravitational wave detection, they have done that for 40 years before they made the first measurable discovery. You know, those are the types of, you know, they've continued to ask why going down that path. The people that are building these missions to go to Mars and other places have been working on this for 20 years and are learning every single day, and they don't learn unless they ask why. Um, each option on your career path is going to have a different challenge. And business is going to be one challenge. Academia is going to be another one. You need to look at those challenges and see if you're well-suited for it. 
from the academia perspective, it's going to be, are you going to be ready to publish and continue to publish, 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 and win grants so you can publish more in business? It's going to be, are you going to be willing to do research that could potentially turn into a product that then is going to be engineered and put into the into the market space? So uh, that's going to be a challenge on, on your skill set. Always network, if, no matter where you're at. Network on an airplane, network on a bus, talk to people. You never know where you're gonna run into someone that you may be able to team up with or collaborate with in the future. Don't ever look back. We all make bad choices. We all make pivots that we probably shouldn't have made. That's a learning point. As it says up there on point number three, something that teaches you something all along the way, but move on. Your goals are forward for the next five years. And then down at the bottom, always have a plan B. If I apply here and this doesn't work, what am I going to do? If this doesn't happen, what will I do next? And I think that has really been highlighted uh, in 2020 because Plan B is all about the, the black swan this year. You know, everything came to a grinding halt. You know, 10 months ago, nine months ago. Um, you know, that, uh, the black swan is, is a reference to something that's a once in a lifetime event that nobody ever sees coming. And, and that's exactly what this cartoon is about: is things can sneak up on you. So. You can't travel. You can't go to this conference. You know, I, I took this job that I took uh, six months before the pandemic hit, and we were right in the middle of talking to investors. I my last major trip was uh, March 9th into New York City to meet with investors for our company. I got back home and the airline shut down, and this was right in the middle of fundraising, right in the middle of writing proposals, uh, right in the middle of trying to build this company stronger, and it had to come to a grinding halt. So what did we do? We found a way to hunker down, everybody connect via video, write more proposals, start briefing people online, and, and leave the company when we had to, to go out and do briefings and come back in and do more. But having a plan B in your back pocket uh, is always critical. You can be a consultant, you can write software code, there are things you can do, but you have to stay up on the skill set and think about what it is that's gonna happen. But when these things pivot like this one did, that shut everybody down, it's something to think about. Uh, sorry about that. There are certain career paths, uh, you know, Brownie in motion one is definitely not the one you want to have where it's start, stop, twist, turn, move all around. Um, I think that's one of the things you'll find as you're looking at jobs and people, and you get into jobs and start reviewing other candidates. I know one of the things I look at is I'm looking at a person who's been in industry for 10 years and they've worked at 12 different places. That's one of these types of career paths. It may be needed, it may not have been, so it's always a red flag. You know, and then there's the career path that you always see that starts down here and you accelerate on an upward trajectory. It's never going to be like that for you either. The, that kind of an ideal model is uh, is flawed and uh, happens, you know, again, like a black swan. So what, what you need to know is this is what the reality looks like. You may start as an engineer and you could branch off and be different kinds of engineers or managers. You may be able to go into product development. You may be able to be a VP. Uh, CTO, COO, CEO, you all have all these different choices to make that will lead to other options. So your career path is an ever breathing, ever evolving type of thing that you're dealing with. It's not, I'm here for a year, I'm here for a year, I'm here for a year. It doesn't always work that way. In most cases, it doesn't. So you need to be ready to make changes when necessary. You need to be ready to continue where you're at as necessary. And again, I think uh, one of the things to, to look, really look at is personal initiative. I think it's uh, it comes down to you managing your career. You know, you are the person solely responsible for you. You need to be able to manage your own career. You need to make your choices for yourself. And remember that uh, you can't let the system manage it for you. And you need to trust individuals that you're going to get advice from. If you're a student, your thesis advisor probably will give you advice, but he may also have other motives. He may want you there for another year or two longer because he wants to continue a project, but yet you're finishing your degree. You need to be ready to, to talk to people, talk to family and friends, find a mentor that may be outside of where you're at that's willing to listen to you, understand where you're at, and give you some of the life experiences that you've had. Set your boundaries in your career. That This one I can't emphasize enough. This one and, and having a work-life balance. These two go hand in hand. And as uh, Drina knows and other people I've talked to know, I really stink at this. You know, my boundaries uh, I'm learning to set here, you know, after 30 years in a career path, work-life balance, still not so great at. Um, 
you know, in the past, uh, you know, a couple of my positions ended up being 90, 100 hour a week jobs because I let them be that. And that's not healthy. It's, it takes a toll on your health. It takes a toll on your mental well-being. It takes a toll on your creativity. If you can't be creative, nobody was going to want to have you on their team. So setting your work-life balance early is essential for longevity in this career. This is a taxing career. You're using your brain always. You're, 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 you're talking about the, the toughest, you know, path to go down academically is in the hard sciences, especially in physics. And then to continue to use your brain to evolve, um, and write papers and things like that is really a challenge. So set your boundaries early, set your, decide with your family what you want to do. Do you want to work 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, and then set those boundaries. You know, go in on an emergency, let your boss know, hey, I'm available if something happens, but my weekends are my own, or you know, whatever that may be. But find outside things to balance your life with, bike riding, mountain climbing, swimming, you know, whatever it may be, because you need to pull your mind away from science to allow it to come back to it more refreshed. Uh, continually, you know, reevaluate your options in your career path and, and down at the bottom, learn and build the skill set to collaborate. It's really, really important to be able to have people on your team that know more about what you know in that area so that they can contribute and take that load off of you to put together a final project. Strategic skills that you can learn, especially in downtime like we've got with this pandemic. Interpersonal skills are tough. That's talking, that's listening, that's, you know, working with other people. Public speaking is another one that is hard for most of us to grasp, and it just takes time. It takes working. It takes, you know, getting in, getting out and being able to do things. Having uh, organizational skills and time management is critical, and especially as you move up in your career. Uh, developing leadership skills, I think, is really important, uh, especially outside of the academic area. Being able to lead a group, lead a team, lead a company, uh, as I put down here in italics, being able to do online video conferences. I can't tell you how many times I've fuddled around with all the buttons and keys here over the last nine months looking onto a new, you know, if it's not Zoom, if it's not, you know, Teams or one of these others, I've got to learn it quickly to be able to talk to somebody. There are business classes that are out there. I strongly suggest that every single person take a business class uh, and learn either finance or management or, you know, at least simple budgeting because no matter where you're at, academia, industry, not for profit, whatever, you're going to have to create budgets with labor and overhead and GNA fees and everything like that attached. Understand how all that interplays. Uh, being able to express yourself in presentations, uh, that's critical. A lot of these skills also, many of the societies, EPS and, and other societies, have training, have, they have webinars, workshops to help train a lot of these uh, soft skills. So make use of them. Many of those are for, are for free for you to be able to use. As I said, networking all along is, is, is a strong thing. Collaborating is a strong thing. Both of those you really need to build early in your career because as you grow and your projects get more spread in terms of, you know, at one point I was working when I was at 2.6 on developing new uh, nano powder based ceramics for high powered lasers. So I had to have people that were nano powder scientists and, and modeling simulation folks and people that were people that understood laser damage on optics and coatings and people that understand centering of powders into solids. Polishing. I mean, there's a broad gamut of individuals. Some of these papers I had 10, 12 co-authors on because I had to have that collaboration in order to go from point A to the final point and to make a complete presentation. So you can learn that, get involved in your student leadership activities to make these collaborations and networkings work. Um, go out there and stay in touch always. Write notes, write emails to colleagues, professors, and academic uh, folks. And, and stay in touch with them as you go along your career path because you may need them again in the future to help you with a, a project or something else you may be working on. Um, and as I said all, all along and as everybody's seen this year, adaptability is critical to survival. You know, broaden your knowledge base every single day. One of my professors told me, pick up a journal, read a different article every single day, different journal paper every single day. That could be something from one of the societies, that could be something from um, a, a peer-reviewed paper, but try to learn something all, at all times. Uh, have a broad skill set. Uh, you, you're, you may be a physicist or something like that, but make sure you're learning chemistry and mathematics and everything along the way that can help you really digest and understand what's, what's taking place. And 
you have to be able to be adaptive when business decisions. If you're working in, a, in business or industry, you're going to have to understand you may have a really good project. You may develop something and have it ready to go. And the business models may show that it may not sell at the market price. It may not be able to manufacture in volumes. Um, you need to be able to hear that and pivot to go to something else and be adaptable. So you may have done all the science right, but the business may say it's not right for us right now. A uh, couple of things here at the end that I wanted to share, a couple of quotes. Uh, this one is as important from 80 years ago as it is today. You're a scientist, you're an engineer, uh, you're an early career professional. Tom Watt, Thomas Watson from that founded IBM said, follow the path of the unsafe independent thinker. Expose your ideas to the dangers of controversy. Speak your mind and fear less the label of crackpot than the stigma of conformity. And on issues that seem important to you, stand up and be counted at any cost. And I think this particular quote of any that I've found and used applies more importantly this year than in the last 30 years of my career. Number one, from a scientific standpoint. Number two, from a political standpoint. And from a personal standpoint, I think with everything, you guys are probably very well aware of the elections taking place in the U.S., the impact it's having, the demeaning of scientists by portions of the current administration. Um, I have colleagues that are afraid to put anything out there that says that what they're doing is wrong. I use social media. I do. I use it sparingly, but when I use it, I use it. Yesterday, I put a post out. Uh, our White House Office of Science said that this was the the, the best year of, in science ever coming out of the White House, and quite frankly, I, I feel it's probably the worst. Uh, they didn't bring scientists in to, to be counted, to listen to what they had to say, and and we we need to have scientists standing up and running for public office, taking part in public policy, and doing things outside of the scientific ri uh, realm where they use their scientific background and speak their mind. So I'm just encouraging you to think about that. You don't have to go out and do it, but it's something that you will be looked upon as someone with a voice and an expert in an area. And if you're asked to speak on something, you ought to think seriously about whether your voice can add something to the dialogue. And I think in many cases it can. So look at both sides of it. Expose yourself to all sides of the argument and understand where your position lands. And in closing, a few little points here. Number one, as I said, success is never guaranteed. Uh, you need to embrace risk and you need to understand failure. Those are, if you look at all of these on here, it's, it's probably the two key points that I've got to make is you're never going to be perfect. You're going to fail. I failed. Everybody I know has failed. You need to be ready for it. Pick yourself up and keep going because you're not always going to be successful. And in getting ready to wrap this up, uh, I, I like sharing this with, with most of the groups I talk to. These are the sustainable development goals that the United Nations puts out. And, and they, they alter and tweak these every year. but I always ask my colleagues in, in the science area to look at these and understand, is there something that I'm working on that can help on any of these goals? And can I volunteer my time or volunteer my research so people can apply something that I'm working on? And, and it's amazing how much in the area of physics and science can be applied to, to some of these 17 goals. So I just challenge you to, to go back and take a look at it every once in a while and see if there's anything you can do to, to help bring those less privileged than a lot of us on this call today, uh, a little bit of a better life. And then finally, in wrapping it up, uh, I think Stephen Hawking really states here best for, from a scientific perspective, what I try to instill in, in students that are trying to make decisions on their careers, trying to understand where they play in this big universe of what looks like a thousand scientists around them. Uh, look up at the stars, don't look down at your feet. Try to make sense of what you see and wonder about what makes the universe exist. Be curious. And I just, I stress on top of that, always be curious. Ask the questions, ask why, and try to continue to push yourself down that path of getting a better understanding of our lives, our universe, and everything around us. And with that, I'll wrap it up and, and move over to take any questions you may have. And, and really thank you for your time. I hope you and your family stay safe with however much longer this, uh, uh, virus hangs around with us, but stay strong. You've got my email here. You've got my, my Twitter. Uh, write me. You need anything. You want to talk about anything. You need advice offline or want to talk about anything. I'm, I'm here to, to help out and uh, stay in contact, please. I would, I would like that.
Thank you very much, Gregory. Uh, thank you. We do have one question by now, at least uh, in our chat. Okay. So, um, uh, you seem to have moved a lot during your career. How much did personal choices affect your career choices? You know, I, I think it did most of the way through. I mean, uh, uh, almost every single one of those pivots that was made had an impact. Um, you know, my, my choice to stay um, with 26 Incorporated, I, I had other offers to go out and be, uh, have leadership positions in industry and other places uh, before that. But um, both of my sons, um, I had committed to them that they wouldn't, I wouldn't be moving uh, anywhere around while, until they finished their high school because I wanted them to have stability in their, in their high school education. So uh, I made the move to uh, B.E. Myers a year after my youngest son finished high school. So those were personal choices I made. It was, it was, I, I mean, and I, and I don't regret it because I can tell you the two six is one of the finest companies I recommend anybody work with. They are all over the world. Um, but those were choices I make based on personal decisions and not the, I mean, there were offers that were significantly better than what I had, but personal choice was to stay with that. So I think every, everything you have plays both personal and professional, and you've got to balance it out. If you have a family, if you have children, um, you know, if you have parents around, uh, my parents were within a half a mile of me when I was in Florida with two six and, and they were getting up there in age. So those were all choices that I wanted to make from a personal standpoint. And then from a professional standpoint, again, you have to look at the job offers. You have to look at where you're interviewing and does it make sense? You know, are you going to have to struggle? Are you going to have to do things that are, are going to not be professionally fulfilling to you? And if so, then you've got to really make a hard decision about whether you want it or not. So I think it, they, they tie in and they interweave pretty strongly. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so if uh, anybody has questions, please, you can unmute yourself and ask it just out loud or yes, or, or use the chat as well. Uh, Mate, would you, would you want to, me to read it or uh, you would ask yourself? I can ask as well, if you can Yeah, sure, me. perfect. Yeah, let's, let's have it. Yeah. Yes. All right, so first of all, thank you, Gregory. It was an really excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. And I was wondering mostly, in case you are, like, I'm doing a PhD now, and I'm actually kind of liking this out of academia kind of career path, but I was thinking, what is the importance of going for a postdoc in case I want to kind of branch out of academia into one of these alternative paths? I, I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, it's, I, I was limited when I came out back in the late 80s. Um, the U.S. was in a pretty severe depression, and there, there were almost zero postdocs to be found. And, and actually, the, the job I took was paying me less to go take that job than I was uh, making as a graduate student. But, you know, it was what it was. It was a job. I, I think that, it, you know, if, if you're thinking about non-academic in the future, I would probably look at a postdoc that has the opportunity to be either go industry or academia. I mean, if you're, if you're doing, say, space, I mean, going to the European Space Agency where you're publishing and you're doing academic work, but there's always the opportunity to spin and go into something industrial related for, for space-based research. The you know, same thing with, with CERN and some of the other, uh, DESI and some of the big research institutes throughout Europe. I would look at some of the postdocs there. Um, I know two years ago I was at the, the ELI facility in Czech Republic and, and they were looking for postdocs there. and and within their facility there, they had three or four laser companies that were already set up and working with the group from Eli. And I know you've got Eli in, uh, in Romania and other locations in Europe. So, you know, looking at places like that for a postdoc gives you a foot in both doors and you're interacting the whole time as a postdoc with both academic and industry uh, colleagues. So that may be a, a really good path to look at for ways to be able to leverage yourself one way or the other when it's time to make that decision. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So does anyone else have any question? Um, yes, I would have a question. Sure, go, go ahead, Richard. Uh, so hi, Greg. Uh, thanks for the great hi, talk. Richard. It was really thank nice. You. 
Um, you have mentioned the importance of work-life balance several times. And as this is something that I guess anyone who did a PhD um, already had some contact with, I am wondering whether you have uh, some established strategies to ensure that you keep the right work-life balance. Because I mean, it's very easy to get lost in the 60, 70, uh, or even more work hours per week. And then I'm wondering right. whether you have some established indicators. Um, you know, I, I think the main thing is just to understand what what do you want your life to look like? You know, what, what do you want your, your work week to look like? What do you want your, um, weekends to look like? What do you want your evenings to look like? I mean, I think that's what, what I find is the, the bleed over from um, minimizing the work-life balance starts usually with your evenings. Um, you know, one of the places where I find myself really getting drug into um, a less than desirable work-life balance is coming home from work and having dinner and then getting on the laptop and answering, you know, some of the 180 emails that I get during the day. Uh, that's work. You know, it may, you know, there may be a soccer game on in the background. There may be something on that, that I have for, for noise, but I'm still working. And I think it's, it's, if you can establish boundaries Monday through Friday, then it makes it a lot easier Saturday through Sunday when, if you're not having to go into the lab. And, and again, I think the, you know, the, the big question that, uh, that has to also be asked is, is this necessary right now? You know, if I don't do this today, will that impact something tomorrow? Uh, you know, one of the things that I always found that worked really well in, in grad school and in, in my early career was a lot of times I would go in on Sunday evenings and get a lot of just the, the paperwork and the timesheets and the, the stuff, you know, the things that take up one or two hours of your morning and then by the end of the day, you still haven't gotten it done, knocked off on Sunday night. And then that opened my morning. I could walk in the door and start working in the lab. And I think if you can look for little tricks like that to, to really optimize your time. And, you know, the, the big challenge that, that I face right now and a lot of my colleagues face is what does the work-life balance look like in a pandemic? And, and mine is, you know, I've, I've, I've got a company that we're growing. I have uh, people that I'm trying to make sure we have jobs for and sustaining those jobs and building more jobs. I'm submitting proposals and the number of calls that I get that say, hey, I need you here for two days. Um, you know, can you fly up and brief us? Well, flying up somewhere, I mean, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm in Florida and having to drive to North Carolina, that's a, you know, eight or 10, 12 hour drive, whatever. I can do that in a day. If I'm in Arizona and I have to go to California, that can be a five hour drive. I can do that without getting on a plane and subjecting myself to a lot of people. But um, I'm, I'm usually the one that um, will have to say, be the, the final decision and say, yeah, we really need to go take this briefing and I've got to fly somewhere and it's a six or seven or eight hour flight. So you've got to look at it and say, do I lose the grant if I don't go do this? Does it impact our company if I don't go do this? Uh, does it impact the people that work for me? Um, and you know, the last thing I want to do is put any of them in harm's way or have them subject to the possibility of catching this. So. You know, a lot of times we're looking at how do we drive, how do we try to teleconference. Some of the stuff we do is classified, so you can't do that without being face-to-face. -face. So it's um, it, it, it's a real challenge. But I think just looking at everything that, <coughs> excuse me, takes you out of your work day and say, is anything going to be negatively impacted if I don't do this today? Can, you know, it's Saturday, can I put it off until Monday morning? It's Saturday, can I put it off until late Sunday night and block off at least two hours, two days? Of downtime and, and the other thing I didn't put in here in terms of work-life balance most jobs come with a vacation take your vacation I mean I strongly encourage you to make sure you use whatever paid time off and holiday time you have um, that's another one of the areas where I know where I haven't done good in the past and you know there's several years where I've you know I went three years and went with one company and never took a day of vacation just because I was CEO and there were things that had to be done so uh, bad excuse you, you can't efficiently manage yourself, manage others, and, and be creative if you're not taking your downtime. So I know nowadays you, you, know, you can't really go a lot of places with your downtime, but you know, find a quiet lake, find some place to go. You know, just get out of your normal routine and take you know, two to three weeks or a week or even a long weekend with no electronics. And I think that's, that to me is the biggest challenge that all of us face right now is how do we you know, 
disconnect from the connectivity that society has with us today. And I think um, in industry, it's pretty, it's a pretty negative influence. You, know, you have to be able to put down your phone. You have to be able to turn off the emails. You have to be able to shut off the laptop and, and leave it behind and not have a panic attack by not being able to have it with you. And that's a struggle I deal with every single day. And it's something that, you know, you need to work with early in your career and say, it's okay to turn my phone off at night beside my bed and, and not have it on um, and, and be able to, to live with that. So those are things I encourage you to look at and try to figure it out early and just say, this is how I'm gonna handle it. And let your boss know that, you know, I've had bosses, especially when we're doing acquisitions that were, you know, two continents away and they would, I would get calls at two, three, four in the morning uh, wanting to talk about something that they've been, that had been discovered in the acquisition process that day and need to be, wake up and be coherent and take the call. So that, that's not a good breeding ground for productivity and, and clarity of mind. So find ways to disconnect from the electronics and I think everything else will come a lot easier. All right. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you, Richard. Good question. Thank you, Greg. And we have uh, another couple of questions in the chat. Uh, okay. Tana, would you want to address it yourself? Uh, or you, you want me to uh, to speak up for you? I think I'll go then. Um, so uh, Tana, which is uh, my colleague from the Action Committee, asks, uh, what do you think is the best way to do networking and maintain an outlook on possible career path during the PhD studies being a quite intense part of someone's career? Are internship key here or is something else more important? You know, I think internships are important, but I also think, um, you know, one of the networking recommendations I make for all students and, and young career professionals is go back and especially, you know, if you're having to work from home and, and, and you're not really all going into the workplace at all times uh, during this lockdown, um, go back and look at talks that you've been to, people that inspired you, people that you may want to work with in the future, and just reach out via email or send them a handwritten note. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's amazing what handwritten notes can do for you. Um, but send an email to somebody and say, hey, I just, I wanted to reconnect with you. I saw your presentation two years ago at, at this meeting on this, and, and I'm looking at doing this or, you know, continuing to look for uh, research opportunities in this area. Um, I'd like to share more about what I'm doing now. Open the door for them to write back. Uh, so I think that kind of networking in the environment today works well. I think, you know, an internship helps you network, but it's typically networking in, outside in a different company or, you know, outside of your, your research environment at the university. But that, for me, that was great to be able to put that onto the, to the resume and, and be able to get that kind of a, a visibility within the industrial market space. Um, and the other, other thing is, too, is um, if, if you are able to travel and there are places that you would like to see, reach out to people that you may know or that you may be able to connect with through other friends and colleagues at that location. So I, you know, I use the, the example of the Eli for the very high brightness laser work a while ago. I mean, if you're going to to Czech Republic or to Romania or to Hungary, and you've got colleagues in those cities and you want to get a tour, right? And say, hey, I'd love to go see the, the laser facilities that Eli has in, in your town. Can you help me arrange for that? I mean, just get a friend to help introduce you there. And then while you go through, you can start a networking process. So it, it's all just about outreach and, and how you go about doing it. So um, internships are great for it, but there's always uh, email and, and handwritten notes that can help do it as well. Again, thank you. And another question uh, that we have. Uh, so, what is your advice on transitioning to work for policymakers? What do they look for in terms of skills, expertise, etc.? Okay, so my, my number one recommendation when you're working with people in policy, um, when you're talking to them about science, talk to them at a elementary school level of science. Uh, when I first went into trying to educate congressmen and, and committees and talk to them about diamond material and laser materials and things like that, it went right over their head. So what you, you have to boil it down to very simplistic 
um, language in terms of this is what this is. It is a solid, and when you put light into it, it generates a different color of light. And the reason this is important is this. And just distill it down to very simplistic levels, but there always has to be a, this is why it's important for you to hear this, the person that you're speaking to. And this is why it's important for our university, our country, our EU, whatever it may be. Help them get a, a feeling for what that importance is and then what the impact is. Um, right now we're fifth in the world in this and we want to be second or third or first in the world. You know, right now, uh, because we don't have this, we can't really address that. Um, you know, let them see it in, in, ter in stark terms of why it's so critical and what that criticality brings to bear on them as they prepare the policy. So they're going to need to know what the cost is and what the benefit is. So, you know, again, going back and getting some business understanding uh, and having an understanding of who you can collaborate with to find out um, what is the real cost of, you know, developing this technology and what is the real long-term benefit of, for our country or for the EU or whoever it may be uh, if we're able to actually do this and what kind of funding do they need uh, from the policy that you could write. So it's, it's not always about the science, but it's about bringing together the big picture at a somewhat simplistic level. If they want to know more, they want to dig deeper, they'll ask you about it. But I would try to gauge everybody that you talk to. I mean, one of, one of the things that I've shared with, with people that I've talked to you know, about strategic policy is look up who you're talking to and get their biographies. Find out what their background is. If they've got a degree in history or if they've got a degree in you know, ancient literature, they're probably not going to understand you know, the physics of neutrinos. So don't try to talk to them about the physics of neutrinos. But you bring it down to a level that they can understand and find a story that you can relate to them about the significance of why, why this could be really, really critical. Um, so that, that's what I would say is just, I mean, it, it took me 15 years to really figure out that I was talking to somebody that probably did not have a strong perspective that I had. So I had to be like a, you know, trying to educate a 10 year old on what I'm talking about and why it's important. If you can break it down to that level, you're probably going to get it through to anybody, no matter what their background or degree is. Thank you very much, Gregory. So, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, are there any questions left? Uh, can I ask the question? Of course, Totne. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, first of all. Uh, I'm, I'm doing masters in, in my country, in Georgia, and I'm, I'm uh, thinking to take uh, another master in Europe, to do it again in physics. Uh, do you think that that's a waste of time or like uh, to go for the PhD? up to the masters from you know I, I i would talk to, you know depending on the institute that you get into um every institute's going to have different requirements they're going to want to have a different skill set when you come in i think most of the time when when i um look at people that terminate with the masters or are trying to decide where to go a, a lot depends on the, the phd that you're looking at is, is it going to be highly experimental or is it going to be theoretical the master's degree that you you earned did you do a high degree of experiment a high degree of theory or was it primarily coursework um, look at what they're looking for for their incoming phd students uh, some places i've seen they get you through another master's degree in a year and directly into a phd program when they see the skill set you have other places you may start on the masters and they may allow you to transition that into a phd without even the master's degree so I, I would just, if you if you find an institute that you like, I, I would go and try to talk to individuals within that institute and just say, this is what I bring. These are the skill sets I have. Is that adequate for what you typically look for in your PhD students? Or would you prefer that I repeat um, or enhance my master's degree with a second master's degree here? Are you looking at a master's degree in the exact same area or is it a, a divergent area from your first? It's my first first year. Um, so, so you're talking about finishing your your master's degree in, in Georgia and then going yeah. elsewhere yes. and looking at a second master's. Yes. Would, would those 
would those two masters be in the exact same fundamental area or would it be, you know, one is in, uh, you know, quantum mechanics and the other is going to be in, uh, you know, energy harvesting. I mean, is no, it no, no. pretty oh. diverse? No, I think um, it, it will, the both will be in applied physics and condensed matter physics. You know, then, then I, I would just take, you know, once you're about ready to complete the master's or start looking at programs, I would just take what you, you know, the, the academic uh, CV that you have and, and send it to the universities you're looking at and saying, this is what I'm earning currently. I, I'm really excited about the opportunity to attend your university. My ultimate goal is to earn a PhD. If you feel I'm better to earn a master's there before transitioning to a PhD program, I'm willing to do that. I welcome your advice. You can do that easily in person if you're allowed to travel. Um, you know, those are the things that I would, I would lead, make that as part of a conversation with the um, committee that may be looking at candidates that are, are being reviewed for the positions. And, and give, it, give it to them, Sam, I'm willing to take either option. I'm willing to come and study for a master's. I'm willing to come and transition directly to a PhD program. This is what I'm completing currently. You know, I welcome your opinion, your, your advice, your input. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, I also wanted to ask uh, myself, so uh, I come from Ukraine. And in Ukraine, usually when you like finish your uh, master's, you go uh, for a PhD, you get a job, and you usually stay there like for ages, most likely for, you know, like forever. Um, do you have an idea of what is, uh, like, how would I say, uh, appropriate time period for staying at one job? And uh, is there any, like, guidance on that? I think, again, I think it goes back to your professional, your professional and your personal choices. I mean, um, if I would have had the perfect job, I, I could have probably stayed there for 35 years. Um, I was always wanting more. I was always, you know, curious about other things. I wanted to, to diversify and ask different questions and, and apply what I had learned in one place and, and challenge myself to go do it somewhere else. So I can tell you that my personal opinion is um, in the physical sciences, when I, when I look at candidates, if they haven't stayed in a, in a position for, you know, if, if I see them what they call job hopping, year one, year one, year one, year one, and they leave at different places, that tells me that either they are hard to satisfy, they have a hard time keeping a job, or it's a, it's a challenge for them to adapt into a different place. I always find it takes, for me, um, somewhere between two and five years to really learn the job I'm in, to bring in new ideas, to assimilate, to to, to, to look at ways that other people run a company, run a, uh, a research group at a, an academic or a government laboratory, and, and really develop skills based upon that. And so I would say, you know, I, I would typically as a professional in our area, you know, you'll feel the urge, I think, internally when you're ready to move and, you, and you're ready to look for something different. That, that signals, hey, it's about time. And if you've been there for at least two years, I'd say that's great. Two to five years, I, I, I start to, to get the itch on a lot of these things. So, you know, it, it, it just, it's just when you feel the time is right and when your personal life and your professional life kind of align with the stars and say, okay, now's the time to go. And, and you start looking. And, you know, you may look for six months. You may look for three years. It's, uh, you've got to find that right landing spot. So it's just what, when you... When you feel like you're ready to go or you feel like you've grown to the point that you can offer something to somebody else. The other thing you'll find is people will approach you and doing things like you're doing with outreach with the young minds and things like that. You get visibility, you get that networking and people say, oh, I, I remember Darina. I'm going to go and call her and see if uh, she has any interest in doing this. Uh, so you're going to find that people are going to start reaching out to you as your career advances and say, boy, do I have the job for you. And then you're going to look at it and say, hey, that looks great. Let's talk more. Or thanks, but no thanks. I'm not ready for that change yet. So uh, it, it'll come. But for professionally, I would say two to five years is probably the range where you really want to start thinking about, am I going to advance where I'm at? Or is it time to move on? Thank you. Yep. So, guys, uh, do we have any questions to Greg left? 
I guess we don't. So I'm just gonna thank you once again, Gregory, for for your time you. and for you know for being so so passionate about what you do. And I I've always loved to hear your talks, and it stays the same. Um, I, and I look forward to coming back and seeing everybody and uh, getting to travel back over again. So please be safe, and thank you for allowing me to to share the excitement I have for for this area. So thank you again. Thank you. So before we end, uh, I know that we have some uh, participants that are not familiar possibly with the EPS and MITES project. So I'm gonna uh, place, uh, or uh, actually Lady Richard placed it, uh, information about uh, EPS and MITES. Uh, you can always learn more about what we do and how to become a part of us. And also, I'd like to take this possibility to announce another webinar, which will take place on uh, November 11th. Uh, we have already posted information about it on Facebook. So, Demolishing uh, Barriers to Science with Marina, I'm afraid to pronounce her uh, surname uh, incorrectly, Serfiada. So, uh, uh, November 11th, 5 p.m. Uh, central, uh, central European time where we'll be happy if we host you to tell you once again. Uh, again, thank you everyone for participation and have a nice evening today. All right, be thank safe. you everyone. Yeah, All right, take be care. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye.